So let us start. Uh, let me just introduce myself. I'm Rudolf Bosov. I'm all the way from South Africa. It's always wonderful uh, to speak to people all across the world, especially in Australia, especially in India. I don't know if you've noticed or know, but Dr. Shreb is obviously already a compatriot in South Africa. He's a dear friend uh, and he's somebody that um, has always been very friendly and respectful, especially of me. And I'm very appreciative of, of uh, him always reaching out. But just to give you a basic introduction, uh, let me just start off and say that the topic of discussion today is what does the Quran say about the Bible? Now, this is a very dense and a very um, interesting topic of discussion, and, and both speakers will obviously endeavor to give their perspectives. But both Christians and Muslims have endeavored to prove uh, the benefit of each of their own respective books. Uh, and for the sake of clarity, today you'll hear uh, Samuel Green. Uh, he basically believes that the Quran uh, clearly attests to the merit of the Judeo-Christian scriptures, where Dr. Schwab denies the very fact. So this will be, like I said, an interesting uh, topic of discussion. And hopefully this will be one that benefits uh, and stimulates a conversation between both Christians uh, and Muslim in a greater whole. So let me just give you a few uh, rules before we start and before I go into introducing the speakers and before I share the structure of the discussion with you. Uh, the rules of the discussion is simply mute yourself. If you can't mute yourself, uh, you'll be chucked out of the room. Just teasing. Uh, no, please mute yourself. It's just distracting for the speaker for the speakers when they have to speak and they hear somebody else in the background whistling or packing away dishes or, or doing or saying anything. So please mute yourself. Also, there will be a Q and A session. Exactly. Please mute yourself. Uh, there is uh, obviously going to be a time for questions uh, in the Q&A section. I'll let you know uh, when I explain the structure of the debate. But please ready your question. If you hear something, write it down, type it so long. So when the Q&A time comes, you can submit it in the chat facility that have been provided uh, on this platform. So let me give you a quick synopsis or introduction of our speakers. Uh, and again, uh, let me just be very frank with you and say that both of these are friends of mine. Dr. Schwab has become a dear friend of mine. Uh, Dr. Samuel Green, well, not Dr. Sorry, Samuel Green, has become a dear friend of mine uh, as well, and I dearly respect both of these individuals. So let me give you a short synopsis of Dr. Schwab and also uh, give you a bit of a bio as to who he is. Uh, Dr. Schwab is a medical doctor by profession, uh, and from his college days, he says he was invited by Christian missionaries for discussions, uh, and this consequently became uh, his hobby by visiting churches, meeting with priests and pastors on a regular basis, uh, and obviously accounting uh, for his own beliefs. Therefore, he uh, started conducting Dawah workshops, training students how to invite non-Muslims towards Islam, uh, and he has debated many pastors in India and also in South Africa. Just um, if you would like to find his channel, you are welcome to go on YouTube. He's got a channel. Uh, I will post it obviously in the chat. Uh, just give you the, the address for that. And uh, also, he uh, sent his email ID. If you would like to, to know his email, it is shwebmohammed62 at gmail.com. Doc, I'm not sure if they, if they can email you, but if they're looking for you, um, they are welcome to do so. Then also on Instagram, it is the tag uh, at Sayed, uh, Dr. Shweb. Uh, you will also uh, see him there. Uh, again, uh, don't flood the, the good doc with uh, 40,000 emails, please. Uh, but if you have a legitimate question, I'm sure good. you would be. Okay, over to Samuel Green, uh, just to share quickly a little bit uh, about him. And uh, I realized uh, this afternoon that uh, Samuel Green has, uh, you know, actually written a book, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. But Samuel has spent more than two decades spending uh, time with Muslims, uh, answering the questions, debating Muslims on different topics, and also endeavoring to answer questions from a Christian perspective, also doing a missionary work amongst Muslims and engaging with Muslims. Uh, he wrote a new book uh, called A New Approach to Engaging with Muslim Friends that was released on the 30th of November in 2019. Uh, if you know anything about Samuel's education, uh, he is a rocket scientist. I'm just teasing. He is, in actual fact, he studied to become a chemical engineer uh, at the University of, uh, I think it's New South Wales, and then theology at Moore Theological College. Um, he works uh, with the Australian Fellowship of Evan Evangelical Students as the, uh, uh, the Islamic Specialist, and he travels around Australia 
and the world speaking on Islam and Christianity as a whole. Uh, he's one of the founding authors uh, at answeringislam.org uh, and the author of the website Engaging with Islam, where you can find a lot of his materials. So if you want to go, you can go uh, www.engagingwithislamoneword.org uh, and you will find the details of Samuel's uh, website there. So let me quickly give you a synopsis of the structure of the discussion today. First of all, Dr. Syed, you've got 30 minutes. Uh, you will be going first. Secondly, Samuel will go. Uh, he'll be speaker B for another 30 minutes as well. Then immediately after that, Samuel will have 15 minutes and a reply to um, Dr. Syed's presentation. After that, Dr. Syed will have a 15 minute reply to Samuel. After that, there'll be another five minutes, uh, five minute reply both from Samuel first and then Dr. Syed. Then it's gonna be the Q&A. Uh, after that, I'll let you know in the chat facility. Uh, keep your eyes peered when you see something posted, please do not comment in the, ch in the chat section. I will let you know when the five minutes, five minute uh, replies start. Uh, that you can start then with your individual questions. You're welcome to post them. Please be reminded, uh, also post questions that are relevant to the topic. Don't post something uh, that is totally irrelevant and something that is obviously not, that does not have to the topic itself. So keep it please to the topic at hand. If there are questions that is unfortunately not based on the conversation that is taking place, I will not read them. Uh, if there's no questions, then we will move on. Dr. Syed will end in with a four minute concluding statement. And then after that, uh, Samuel Green will also conclude with a four minute statement in and by himself. Okay, so that is the structure of the debate. The authors and obviously the speakers have agreed to that. And uh, for the next few moments, I'm gonna hand over to Dr. Syed. All praise be to Allah, the cherisher and sustainer of the worlds and peace and blessings of Allah be on his prophet, last prophet and his companions and the Righteous follows after him. Rabbish Wahli Sadri wa Yasirli Amri, Wahlul Ugdakam Ilisani Yakam Kori. Dear brothers and sisters, I greet you all with the Islamic greeting. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, which means peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah be on all of you. The topic of this debate is what does the Quran say about the Bible? And this is on the screen what does the Quran say about the Bible? And let me say that it says nothing. Quran says nothing about the Bible. It doesn't say Bible is corrupted and it doesn't say Bible is preserved. I'm repeating, it says nothing. It doesn't say Bible is corrupted or it doesn't say Bible is preserved. It is not preserved, it is not integrated. It doesn't say anything. Why I'm so confident about it? Because the word Bible doesn't exist in the Quran. The word Bible is not there in the Quran. If the word Bible is not there in the Quran, how is it possible to say anything about the Bible in the Quran if the word Bible doesn't exist in the Quran? There are 6,000 plus verses in the Quran, but not one verse mentions the word Bible. The word Bible doesn't exist in the Bible too. You don't have the word Bible in the Bible too. There are 31,102 verses in the Bible, but not one verse mentions the word Bible in the Bible. So conclusion of this slide is Quran and Bible both do not say anything about the Bible. Quran or Bible do not say anything about the Bible. The words are used in two ways, meaning wise and mentioning wise. Mr. White, Mr. Black, these are names, used for names. And, and it is said that they are used as mentioning wise. They are proper names, they are proper nouns. It is not used meaning-wise. When we say not used in meaning-wise, meaning that when we use the word, when we say call out the name Mr. White, it doesn't mean the skin of the person is white. When we call out Mr. Black, it doesn't mean that the skin of the person is black. No, it is not used meaning-wise, it is a proper name. But when we say snow is white and coal is black, then this is used as meaning-wise, meaning that the color of the snow is white, color of the coal is black. White, uh, white and black are used here meaning white. So this is very important to note. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God Almighty, He has given revelations to all nations. By name, in the Quran, there are four revelations mentioned. And these are proper names. Common, not common names, proper names. Torah was given to Moses upon him. 
Zabur was given to David, peace upon him. Injil was given to Jesus, peace upon him. And the Quran given to the Prophet Muhammad. So there are four revelations by name we know. That doesn't mean there were only four revelations, there are many revelations. Torah, Zabur, and Injil are used in the Quran mentioning wise. They are proper names. Kutub, meaning books. Sharia, meaning law. Bashara, meaning good news, are used meaning wise. They are not proper names. They are common nouns. So don't mix up with proper names and common nouns. Don't mix up with that. Christians are deluded. Some Christians are in delusion that the Quran confirms the Bible. I want to repeat. Some Christians, including Pastor Samuel, are deluded. They are in delusion that the Quran confirms the Bible. Quran does not confirm the Bible. Quran confirms the Torah and the Injil. Quran confirms the Torah and the Injil. Quran does not confirm Bible. Nowhere, as I mentioned, the word Bible doesn't exist in the Quran. Quran does not confirm even Kadim Ahadnama, the word for Old Testament. The word for Old Testament. Quran does not confirm Kadim Ahadnama. In Arabic, Kadim Ahadnama means the Old Testament. Quran also does not confirm Jadid Ahadnama. Jadid Ahadnama means New Testament. In Arabic, Jadid Ahadnama means New Testament. Or even the Quran doesn't use the word Tanakh. The Tanakh word is used by Jews for their Old Testament. Jews call their Old Testament Tanakh. So even Quran doesn't use the word Tanakh. So Quran doesn't confirm Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, or Tanakh. Quran confirms only Torah and the Injil and the Zabur and the revelation that was revealed on prophets. There are many, many verses which speaks about Torah and Injil. Many verses. Chapter 5, verse number 46. Chapter 3, verse number 3. Chapter 5, verse number 68. Many verses, it speaks about Torah and Injil. Everywhere, Torah and Injil. No Old Testament, no New Testament, no Bible. It is very wrong on your part to take Torah and Injil as Bible. It will be very, very wrong to take Torah and Injil as Bible. No, but... Torah and Injil is not Bible. Torah is a revelation from God to Moses. Injil is a revelation from God to Jesus. Torah and Injil is not the Old Testament. So Torah, it says Torah and Injil everywhere. Not Old Testament and not New Testament. Chapter 5 of number 47. Well, yahkum ahalul Injili bima anzallahu fihi. Let the people of the Injil judge by what Allah hath revealed therein. Now, who are the people of the Injil? People of the Injil are those people who possess the Injil with them. Those who have the Injil that was revealed to Jesus. Those are the people of the Injil. You don't claim to possess the Injil by Jesus. You claim to possess the Injil by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the New Testament books. So Injil is not the New Testament. People of the Injil are not the people of the New Testament books. Let me clear. People of the Injil are not the people of the New Testament. Jesus in his lifetime, he preached the Injil. Jesus when he was alive, he preached the Injil. Injil was revealed on him and he preached the Injil. Not Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, which comes into existence later in period. Mark is the first gospel that comes into, into picture 35 to 40 years after Jesus Christ. John is the last gospel comes into picture 100 years or 115 years after Jesus Christ. So these scriptures, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, did not exist in Jesus' time. He was not preaching Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. He was preaching the gospel revealed to him. So he says in Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, in the, in the Bible, in New Testament 9.35, and Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching the gospel and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. So preaching the gospel, Jesus is preaching the gospel. Which gospel he was preaching? He was not preaching Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. He was not carrying Matthew, Mark, Luke and John under his arm. And he was not preaching Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. He was preaching the gospel revealed on him. Matthew chapter 11, verse number 5. The blind received the sight and the lame walked. The lepers are cleansed and the dead hear. The dead are raised up. And the poor have the gospel reached to them. Poor have the gospel reached to them. There are 98 references of the gospel in the Bible, in the New Testament, especially 
in the New Testament, 98 references. But always, most of the time, it is gospel of Jesus, gospel of Jesus, gospel reading Jesus, gospel of Jesus, not gospel according to Matthew, gospel of Jesus. So Jesus preached the gospel well before in during his period, during his life period, when he was walking on this earth, he was preaching the gospel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John comes into picture later in period. So just be clear, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is not the NG. Jesus himself, he said in John chapter 5, verse 30, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. From whom he was hearing? He was not hearing from Tom, Dick, and Harry. He was hearing from God. So whatever he heard from God, that is the Injil, we say. He says in John chapter 12, verse number 49 and 50, for I have not spoken of myself. You see what Jesus is saying. I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he has spoken me. Father has spoken. He gave me a commandment. What I should say and what should I speak. He has given a commandment. What I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, whatever I speak, therefore, whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, like the Father has said unto me, so I speak. So he's making it very clear that whatever he's speaking, it is speaking from God. So whatever he was speaking from God, that is the Injil I'm saying. That is the Injil. So Jesus preached the Injil. Jesus spoke the Injil. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is not the Injil revealed to Jesus. People of Injil and people of New Testament, they are two different groups. People at the time of the prophet Muhammad had the Injil. They had the Torah also. People at the time of prophet Muhammad had the Injil. They were different from the present day Christians. They were different people. They believed in one God. They were Unitarian Christians. Later on, they, they came to known, they, they came to be known as later Unitarian Christians. And not Trinitarian. They were people of the Injil because they possessed the Injil. Trinitarian Christians never ever claim to possess the Injil revealed to Jesus. You don't have any idea that Injil was revealed to Jesus. There is a story behind it. I will, I'm not able to give you the story because of time limit. But Trinitarian Christians never ever claim to possess the Injil revealed to Jesus. So you don't have any idea about that. Therefore, they were at the time of Muhammad and are today, at the time of today, the people of New Testament. Today, the people, you are the people of New Testament, not people of Injil, because you don't possess the Injil. Now what happens? You call them having spurious, fabricated, unreliable books. The Unitarian Christians, whatever books they had, you call them having spurious, fabricated, unreliable books. They in turn, they call you having spurious, fabricated, unreliable books. After a few centuries, Islam reached them the people of the Injil, the Unitarians. When Islam came, when Prophet Muhammad came, Islam spread and Islam reached the Northern Africa area. The Unitarian Christians, seeing the teaching of Injil in line with the Quran, it led them to a Quran and Islam. Torah and Injil had the prophecy of the Prophet Muhammad clearly mentioned in the Injil and the Torah. That made them accept Islam easily. And after you accept Islam, then you follow the Quran. Then Quran is, in, Quran is in your life. You follow the Quran. You don't follow any other book. Even if Torah and Injil was present at, in, in his time, he, they could not follow. They are not supposed to follow Torah and Injil because Quran displaced the Injil. So this is how Quran displaced the Injil. Now what happens with a book which is not used regularly, which is not used? For years, it is not used, and I, consequently, what will happen? The book, got, the book got lost within a period of three centuries. The Injil was lost. Today, we do not have the Injil revealed to Jesus. We do not have the Torah. We do not have the Injil revealed to Jesus and Moses. Now, sometime after Jesus Christ was upon him, there were those who believed in one God, the Unitarian Christian. Some believed in two gods. The Martianites, they believed in two gods. Some believed in three in one and one in three gods. You people, Trinitarians, you believed in Trinity. Three in one and one in three gods. 
there were many different faiths existed amongst the followers of Jesus Christ after Jesus Christ. There were many different faiths existed in the second century, third century. There were many different faiths existed amongst the followers of Jesus Christ. All claimed to be the followers of Jesus Christ, having their own book to support their beliefs. The Unitarian Christians, those who believed in one God, they had their book to support their belief. Probably the Injil they had. The, the Banitarian who believe in two gods, they had the scripture to support their belief. They had 10 letters of Paul and one gospel according to Luke and they made 11 book Bible, 11 book book. They incorporated the concept of two gods in that book. And you people, you have three in one, one in three, believe in three, 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 three. Your scripture, your New Testament, you try to support from your New Testament, treaty. So everyone has a book to support your belief. There are evidences that, that, sorry, there are evidences that lots of scriptures, good and bad, did not make in the New Testament. They were lost. Example, the Gospel of Nazarenes, the Gospel of Ebionites, the gospel, of, the gospel according to the Hebrews, the gospel according to the Egyptians. There were 400 different gospels, 400 different, different, different gospels, 400 different gospels. There were only four are selected. By who? By Bishop Athanasius. He selected the New Testament book. So there were so many gospels, so many books that did not make in the New Testament. And different faiths existed. We don't know them all. We don't know them all. So the 73 books of the Roman Catholic's Bible and 66 books of the Protestant's Bible are not the Torah, the Zabur and the Injil. Torah was destroyed twice before Jesus Christ. And I'm not saying that. Christian scholars, they're saying, all the scholars unanimously agree that the original Torah and other original books of the Old Testament were destroyed by the forces of Nebuchadnezzar. When the books were recompiled through Isra, these two were later destroyed during the invasion of Antiochus. You put on Google, Nebuchadnezzar and Torah, Antiochus and Torah, and you'll have the detail of destruction of Torah. The Torah was destroyed utterly before Jesus Christ. John Mill, Catholic scholar, he also confirms that Torah was destroyed twice before Jesus Christ. Jesus was taught Torah after Jesus after the Torah were destroyed and lost, Jesus revived the Torah because Allah says in chapter 3, verse number 48, Allah And Allah will teach him, teach him whom? Jesus. Allah will teach him the book and the wisdom. The Torah and the Injil. After the Torah were destroyed and lost, Jesus revived the Torah once again from God. Not the Old Testament or Tanakh. He did not revive the Old Testament of Tanakh. Don't, 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 don't be mistaken with that. Now, all past revelations that were revealed by God are impractical for preservation. Are impractical for preservation. Chapter 13, verse number 38 in the Quran, it, means, it says, Likulli ajalin kitab. For every ajal, for every period, we had given revelations. There were 313 messengers of God. This means... There were 313 revelations of God, including the Torah, Zabur, and Injil. Now, what is the point of having 313 revelations altogether preserved and intact for today? No, 313 revelations will be too much for us. So only one revelation, one book is enough at a time. So it is all to be preserved and intact will be impractical. I'm saying once last latest edition arrives, all previous revelations become outdated. Quran is the last revelation. Quran is the last revelation. Now, Quran, nowhere it says that it will not, the past revelation will be preserved. Quran, nowhere says that the past revelation will be preserved. Chapter 2, verse number 106 in the Quran, Surah Al-Baqarah says that the revelation can be substituted. Revelations can be substituted. Now, if you substitute a revelation, then the previous revelations become done and white. So there is a substitution concept about scripture. Now none can change the words of Allah. This is grossly mistaken 
by the Christians. It, it's Christian misunderstanding that it speaks about Torah and Injil. The verses do not speak about any revelation and definitely not the Old Testament and the New Testament. Quran is not speaking about any revelation. It is ridiculous to mean for the Old Testament and New Testament. It's a gross error on their part. Let us take one example. Quran chapter 6 verse number 115. The word of thy Lord doth find its fulfillment in truth and justice. This is not speaking about revelation. This is the promise of God coming to fulfillment in truth and justice. None can change his word. This is the promise of God, not the revelation. For he is the one who heareth and knoweth all. It is not speaking about revelations. Umar Razia Tala, he brought some, from somewhere a copy of Torah. And he showed to Prophet Muhammad, Oh Prophet, this is Torah. And he started reading, putting his head down from the Torah. When he started reading, Prophet Muhammad got angry. And whereupon Abu Bakr said, Would that told to Umar Razilatalano, Umar peace be upon him, whereupon Abu Bakr Razilatan said to Umar, Would that your father, would that your mother mourn you? Don't you see the face of Allah's Messenger? Umar Zatila saw the face of Allah's Messenger, peace be upon him, and said, I seek refuge with Allah from the wrath of Allah and the wrath of his messenger. We are well pleased with Allah as Lord, with Islam as religion, and with Muhammad as prophet. Whereupon Allah's messenger, peace upon him, said by him, in whose hand is the life of Muhammad, even if Moses were to appear before you, even if Moses were to appear before you, and you were to follow him, leaving me aside, leaving prophet Muhammad aside, and follow Moses, you would certainly stray into error. So if Moses was alive now, for that matter, if Jesus was alive now, for that matter, for if David, if David was alive now, for that matter, so if any prophet of God is alive now, this is what Prophet Muhammad is saying. If Moses, if, Mo, if Moses was alive now and he found my prophetical ministry, he would have definitely followed me. So now, even if you have the Torah and Injil today, you are supposed to follow the Quran. If Jesus is alive, he will follow the follow Prophet Muhammad. If Christians are alive and they found the they find the prophetical ministry of Prophet Muhammad, they are supposed to follow the Quran. If Jews are alive and they find the prophetical ministry of Prophet Muhammad, they are supposed to follow the Quran. They are not supposed to follow Torah and Injil, even if it is preserved and intact today. This is there in Sunan Darmi, Volume 1, Hadith number 435. Now, Christians tell us Bible is authored by 40 different human authors in a period of 14 to 15 centuries. Torah and Injil are authored by God, revealed by God. Torah and Injil, Torah and the Injil are authored by God, revealed by God. Biblical books are authored by human beings. Therefore, it is easy to conclude Bible is not the Torah and the Injil. Bible is not the Torah and the Injil. Now, George Arthur Patrick, he says, the original copies of the New Testament books have, of course, long since disappeared. He's explaining how the original copies were destroyed. The original copies of the New Testament books have, of course, long since disappeared. This fact should not cause surprise. In first place, the, they were written on papyrus, a very fragile and perishable material. So it got lost. So nobody should be surprised. In the second place, he says, and probably of even more importance, the original copies of the New Testament books were not looked upon as scripture by those of the early Christian communities. Early Christian communities did not look upon the New Testament books as scripture. So if it was not considered as scripture, when it was started to be considered as scripture, later on, Torah and Injil were scriptures from the first day, from the first moment. Torah and the Injil were the scriptures from the first day, from the first moment. They are not Old Testament and New Testament. The New Testament books are not the Injil. The New Testament books are not the Injil. When Paul was writing his letters to his different churches to solve the problem they faced, was he thinking that he was writing books of the Bible, books of God? Imagine, how can a person who's writing a letter to different churches think that he's writing books of God? 
he was not thinking that he is writing books of God. No, not at all. David Pawson, another Christian scholar, in his Unlocking the Bible, on page 927 says, he, Paul, had no idea that his letters would be regarded as scriptures. Paul had no idea his letter would be regarded as scriptures. How can you say that these are the words of God? Injil was the scripture from the first day. Injil was the scripture from the first moment, from the first day. The New Testament books are not the Injil. The letters of Paul, the books, the New Testament books are not the Injil. No scholar, no Bible author, he claims that he is inspired by God. Suppose today you go home and Angel Gabriel appears, appears to you and he trickles you and you may, he makes you write certain scripture, certain things, one page, two page, and he goes away. Will you keep quiet? No, you will not keep quiet. You will speak, speak out to your parents, your, your friends, your relatives, your, uh, your friends and people around. Some people will believe you, some people will reject. There will be stories behind it. Such story you don't find from the biblical author. It says Matthew was inspired by God or Holy Spirit. Did he share his experience with anyone? No author of any book of the Bible share his experience of being inspired by the Holy Ghost. So how can you say there is a scripture? This is not a scripture, it's a human book. Deuteronomy chapter 34 verse number 5, 6, 7. Now Deuteronomy is attributed to Moses. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab, again, over against Beth -Pure. But no man knoweth of his sepulchre unto this day. No sepulchre unto his day. Why? Because all people are years old when he, his eyes was not dim, nor his natural course abetted. How can Moses speak like this, that Moses was 120 years old when he died? Moses cannot speak like this. Somebody else is speaking after Moses. Somebody else Five is speaking left. after Moses. Pardon? Five minutes left, Doc. Okay, okay. Somebody else is speaking after Moses. Moses is not speaking these words. So, so Old Testament books are not the Torah. John chapter 13, verse number 36. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither goest thou? Where are you going? 1336, John 1336 says, Simon Peter said to Jesus, Where are you going? John chapter 14, verse number 5. Thomas said unto him, Lord, speaking to Jesus, saying, We know not whither thou goest. Where are you going? We do not where are you going. So both Simon Peter and Thomas they are inquiring, Where are you going? John chapter 16, verse number 5. Jesus is speaking. But now I go my way to him that sent me. And none of you ask me where Vida goes thou. None of you ask me where I am going. How is it possible? Somebody is lying. Somebody surely lying. Such a discrepancy cannot be the cannot be part of the Bible. Cannot be part of the Injil. Sorry, such a discrepancy cannot be the part of the Injil. So New Testament books are not the Injil. First Corinthians chapter fifteen verse number three and four. Paul is saying that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures according to the scripture and he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scripture this phrase according to the scripture means that it is there in the old testament because new testament books did not exist even in paul's time so it is there in the old testament where is the statement that he will rise again from the dead the third day in the old testament this is not there in the old testament it is missing it is not there if it is not there in the Old Testament, then Paul is lying. Paul is lying. This is a false statement. Luke chapter 24, verse number 46. And, and said unto them, Thus it is written. Thus it is written, meaning that it is written in the Old Testament. Does it behove to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day? Does it behove Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day? This phrase, rise from the dead the third day, it is not, in, not there in the Old Testament. So even Luke is lying, the companion of Paul, even Luke is lying. John chapter 20 verse number 9. For as yet they knew not the scripture. They knew not the scripture means it is there in the scripture, only the disciples did not know it. For as yet they knew not the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. This statement, he must rise again from dead, it is not there in the Old Testament. It is not there in the scripture. 
So again, Paul, John is also lying. How can you attribute this lie to Injil? These are false statements. Injil cannot contain false statements like this. Show me where is there in the scripture. This is not there in the scripture. I am asking pastors after pastors. They are giving Hosea chapter 6, verse 2 and 3. Hosea chapter 6, verse 2 and 3, it speaks about Ephraim and Judah reviving from sin. They are speaking about sin. Nobody is dying. They did not die. If anybody had died in the Old Testament and risen up back after three days, it will be amazing. It will be a news, but no, nothing is there. So such a statement is not there in the New Testament. So new, in the Old Testament. So New Testament books are not the Injil. To sum up, Quran does not mention anywhere the word Bible. Bible does not mention anywhere the word Bible. Quran confirms the Torah and Injil and not the Bible, Old Testament or New Testament. Christians sign delusion that Quran confirms the Bible. Jesus preached the Injil and not Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. The gospel of Jesus is not the same as the gospel according to Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Torah was destroyed twice before Jesus Christ. Quran does not say all past revelations are preserved. None can change the words of Allah does not mean revelations. Even if Torah and Injil existed, existed, you cannot follow them after Quran. Biblical books are authored by human beings. Torah and Injil authored by God. New Testament books are not considered scriptures by early Christian communities. Injil by Jesus was the scripture from the first moment. New Testament books are not the Injil. Paul had no idea his letter would be regarded as scriptures. No biblical author shares, shares his experience of inspiration. Moses cannot say he was 120 years old. This cannot be Torah. He was 120 years, well, he was 120 years old when he died. Simon, Peter, Thomas or Jesus, somebody is lying. According to the scripture, this statement is a false statement. Paul is lying, Luke is lying, John is lying. You cannot attribute such lies to Injil. Conclusion, Quran does not confirm a human book, the Bible. Quran confirms God revealed books, the Torah and the Injil. Quran says nothing about the Bible. Quran. I am finished. I am finished. Thanks, Doc. Well, Samuel, I'm not sure if you're on or I, I bet you can, yeah, but uh, you're welcome to ready your presentation. I don't know if you've got something that you need to present. Well, hello and welcome, everybody. And I want to thank Rudolph for persevering and organizing this debate and Shuaib for participating and for what he's just said to us. And I hope that everyone today will find this helpful as we discuss this question. That the question is, what does the Quran say about the Bible? And I want to say that this question matters for a couple of reasons. One is we should want to understand the Quran correctly. But secondly, Muslims tell Christians that the Quran says the Bible is corrupted. And this, of course, stops any type of dialogue and gives Muslims a dismissive attitude, which we've really seen with uh, Shuaib today, just dismissing me and saying that I'm full of delusion and, and that type of thing. And so Muslims feel that they can pick and choose different verses from the Bible when they're reading it. And of course, that's not a good way to read any book. It's not a good way to read any book. Muslims also tell us that they believe in all of the books. It's one of the basic beliefs of Islam. Yet what we find is that they pick and choose and say, well, but not your book, not your book. And so we're not really sure what you actually mean by that. Um, or we don't agree with what you're saying with that. And so it's actually a really an important question for us as to what does the Quran say about the Bible? You know, does the Quran endorse the Bible? Um, and so what I want to do today is, and I will do a screen share now. I will start my uh, thing here. So um, I'm going to have, oops, let's get this up. Start the slide, let's go from the beginning. Uh, this is my structure. I want to talk about the context of the Quran. I want to read three chapters in context about what they say about the Bible. I want to look at a few individual verses, look at verses which say that God's word can't be changed, and then look at what is the Torah and the gospel. So that's where we're heading. Well, let's start. Uh, what is the context of the Quran? That is, in what context does the Quran talk about the Bible? Well, it has to do with the people of the book. 
Now, the, the word book is the Greek word, uh, sorry, in Greek, the word for book is Bible. And so the word people of the book is actually just saying people of the Bible. That's, that's what we say. That's what the Bible's called. It's called the people, no, it's, it's called the, the Bible, the book. It's our book. It's, that's the Greek word from the culture it came from. But the context is that the Jews have their book, the Torah, in Hebrew, and the Christians have their book, the Injil, in Greek. And you need to understand the word Injil is actually a Greek word. Every time you read the word Greek, uh, Injil in the Quran, that word comes from, from the Greek language, from the, from the gospel, from the New Testament. That's where the word comes from, from the New Testament. That's the Injil. That's what you read about with Jesus preaching the Injil. Now, th that is, what is the context? Uh, what is the context uh, of, sorry, that is, this is the context of the scriptures around Muhammad. The scriptures around Muhammad are not in Arabic. Now, we see this. It's narrated by Abu Huraira. The people of the book used to read the Torah in Hebrew and then explain it in Arabic to the Muslims. And so the Jews are publicly reciting their scriptures in Hebrew and giving an oral translation and explanation to the Muslims in Arabic. And the Christians are doing something similar. So when we read the Quran, this is the context we're coming into. The people of the book are reciting their book in one language and, and explaining it to the Muslims in another. And this is really important for us to understand what the Quran is saying about Jews, Christians, and the Bible. Now, what I want to do is to look at the theme of the Bible in Surah 5. I don't just want to pick and choose verses. I actually want to follow a theme of the Bible in an entire chapter. And chapter 5 has the longest systematic treatment of it. So here's the uh, accusation in the Quran. And because of their breaking of the covenant, they, the Jews, change words from their places. And they have forgotten a part by which they were reminded. We also took a covenant from those who say we are Christian. But they have forgotten a part by which they were reminded. O people of the scripture, now has come to you our messenger, explaining to you much of what you used to hide from the scripture and passing over. So there's the accusation in chapter 5. Now, what's the observation? Well, there are Christians and Jews who are forgetting and changing words from their places, moving them, hiding them, passing over them. And this is actually referring to the oral explanation and translation of the Bible that they're giving to the Muslims. It never says the text has been changed. Now, what does the Surah 5 actually say about the text of the Bible? Well, let's have a look. Why do they, the Jews, make you, Muhammad, judge when they have the Torah in which is God's judgment? We reveal the Torah in which there is guidance and a light. Those who do not, not judge by what God has sent down, those are the ungrateful. So what do we see here? We see that the Jews have the Torah, right? And we know what the Torah was in, Muhammad, in, in Arabia. We know the, the Jews, what the Jews have as the Torah in the sixth century. Uh, it, it's, they have the original of Moses. It's not lost. It's not said to be corrupted. And we are told it is reliable and they are to judge by it. Now, what does it say about the gospel? Well, we cause Jesus, the son of Mary, to follow in their footsteps, confirming that which had been revealed before in the Torah, and we bestowed on him the gospel, in which is a guidance and light. Let the people of the gospel judge by what God has sent down in it. Those who do not judge by what God has sent down, those are the reprobates. So the observations here are, the gospel of Jesus is what Christians have. It goes from Jesus was given the gospel. Christians are to judge by the gospel. They have the original. It's not lost. That's just what the gospel, uh, the Quran is saying. Now, some Muslims say that the gospel of Jesus is not Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Well, I want to say you are claiming too much detail from the Quran. The Quran does not even mention the seven Aharuf or the 30 Kira'at when describing itself. The Quran is not a book of detail. You have to go to the Hadith for detail. And so I'm sure you know that, that the, the Quran is not just one book, but there are seven different harufs. There were the early different collections. Uthman got rid of most of the collections and standardized one. But even today, there are many different Quran, different versions of the Quran that you can read. Now, the Quran doesn't talk about the haruf, the Quran. It doesn't mention any of those. And in the same way, it doesn't mention Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It just speaks in very general terms. And so the Jews and the Christians have the gospel and Torah, and they are reliable, and they're both to judge by them. 
Say, O people of the book, you have no base until you observe the Torah and the gospel and what has been sent down to you from your Lord. Now let's continue with uh, Surah 5. We have sent down to you the scripture, the Quran, in truth, confirming all that scripture was before it and a watcher over it. So judge between them by what God has sent down. And now look at this. To each one of you, Jew, Christian, Muslim, we have assigned a path. That is the Torah, the gospel, and the Quran, and a way of action. Had God willed, he could have made you one community, but he has not done so that he may try you. He has given you what he has, uh, sorry, but uh, that he may try you in what, he, in what has come to you. Sorry, it was a little hard for me to read that. And so each community has been given a book and they are to judge according to their book. And you'll notice God could have made us one community, but he's actually said he's made us three communities and we're all to follow our own books. So to finish up, say, O oh people of the book, do you blame us, Muslims, for any reason other than we believe in God and what has been sent down to us and what has been sent down previously? So Muslims are to believe in the scriptures of the Christians and the Jews. So uh, does the Quran endorse the, 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 uh, the Bible? Yes. The Torah of Moses is with the Jews. The gospel of Jesus is with the Christians. The Bible has not been abrogated or corrupted. Rather than turning Jews and Christians away from their books, the Quran commands each community to obey and judge according to their own book. The Quran claims to confirm the Bible and to be a watcher over it. We must let the Quran confirm itself. Okay, so let's look at Surah 3 now and look at the whole theme of the Bible in Surah 3. So here's the accusation. And remember, God took a covenant from the people of the book to make it known and clear to mankind and not to hide it. But they threw it behind their backs and purchased with it some miserable gain. There is among them a section who distort the book with their tongues as they read. You would think it's part of the book, but it is not, it is not part of the book. And they say it is from God, but it is not from God. It is they who tell a lie against God, and well they know it. So what do we see here? Well, we see that these Jews are, um, are hiding the message of Scripture. They're twisting the message of their Scripture. They're trying to make profit from it. But again, this is all to do with the oral explanations and the translation of the Bible. It never says the text has been changed, but that they're twisting it, as we saw at the beginning, as they explain it. And notice also... It's only a group of them who do it. It never says all Christians and Jews do this. Now, what does Surah say, then say about the text of the Bible? Well, here is the actual application that it gives. Say, we believe in God and in what has been revealed to us and what was revealed to Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, Jacob, and the tribes, and in the books given to Moses, Jesus, and the prophets from their Lord. We make no distinction between one and another among them. So the observations are Muslims are not to make any distinction between the prophets or their books. There's to be no distinction. When Muslims say, oh, your book's been superseded or something, you've made a distinction. You are to make no distinction. In fact, when uh, Muslims are to say to Jews if, uh, that if Jews want to sh prove something, what are they to say? Say, bring the Torah and recite it if you tell the truth. So Jews are meant to bring the Torah to Muslims and show their evidence from their book. Okay. Now, so does the Quran endorse the Bible? Yes. It says, make no distinction between the books and that Christians and Jews are meant to bring their proof from their books. Again, we must let the Quran interpret itself. The final surah I want to look at is surah two. And the accusation is, are you Muslims eager that they should believe you when a group of them used to listen to the words of God and then change them after they understood them knowingly. And when they meet those who believe, they say, we believe. But when they are on their own with another, they say, do not tell them what God has revealed to you. Do they not know that God knows what they hide and what they make public? Among them are the Umi, who know the scriptures only as vague ideas. They only guess. Woe to those who write the scripture with their own hands and then say, this is from God so that they may sell it for a paltry price. Woe to them for what their hands have written. Woe to them for what they earn. Now, what's the, the context and everything here? Well, there's a group of hypocritical Jews and ignorant Arabs who would listen to the Torah and change it by hiding what was in it, 
when it was read aloud. And some of them were writing out these poor translations for sale to the Muslims. They wanted profit for, for, from selling scripture and they're condemned for this. But notice the context, it's a local situation around Medina. It is saying nothing about the global situation of the Bible. It's just a local situation. So, does Surah, uh, so what does Surah 2 say about the text of the Bible? Well, again, say, we believe in God and in what was revealed to us in the Quran and in what was revealed to Abraham, Isaac, Ishmael, Jacob, and the tribes, and what was given to Moses and Jesus and what was given to the prophets from their Lord. We make no distinction between any of them. So again, no distinction is to be made between the prophets or between their books. Uh, it's not saying that the Bible is corrupted or superseded. Uh, it, it, it's just not saying that. And again, the challenge is put to Jews and Christians to bring your proof if you tell the truth. So Christians and Jews are meant to bring their Bible and present their evidence for what they believe from their books. Uh, you can't make that request if the Bible's not reliable. And then, uh, and then finally, we see um, uh, Surah 2, verse 85. Do you believe in part of the scripture and not believe in, uh, in, in sorry, do you believe in a, in a part of the scripture and not believe in uh, another part of it? I'm sorry, I haven't written that out very carefully there. The idea is, do you just believe in one part and not all of it? That's the idea of the scripture there, of, of the Quran verse there. And so it, it's saying there that it's, you know, that, that Christians are to believe all of their scriptures. They're not to be picking and choosing, right? And so particularly when they're translating it to the Muslims, they're not to be picking and choosing. Um, so, uh, and so let's continue in chapter two and believe in what, so Jews and Christians are to believe in what Allah has revealed, confirming the revelation, which is with you. And so when a, uh, when a, when the, when a scripture, the Quran comes to them, the Jews, from God confirming what is in their possession, right? So these references are clear that it's the scripture that is in the possession of the Christians and Jews. So Christians are to consult the Bible to confirm Muhammad. The Bible is an authority that confirms that the Quran is from God. The Quran is not saying that it corrects the Bible. In fact, it says the opposite. The Bible is evidence for the Quran. So does Surah 2 endorse the Bible? Yes. It says no distinction is to be made between the books. Christians and Jews are to bring their proof from the Bible. It says that all of it is true and they're not to pick and choose. Choose. It's the scriptures that is with the Christians and the Jews. And Christians are to consult the Bible to confirm Muhammad. The Bible is an authority that confirms that the Quran is from God. Again, what I'm doing here is just letting the Quran interpret itself. Now, what I'd like to do is just look at some individual verses rather than just look at um, th those big surahs in the way that I had given uh, an overview of three major surahs. Let's look at individual verses now. O you who believe, believe in God and his messenger and in the scripture which has come down to his messenger and in the scripture which he has sent down previously. So Muslims are meant to believe in the scripture that came down before them. Do not dispute with the people of the book, except with what is better. Instead, say, we believe in what has been revealed to us and what has been revealed to you. Again, it doesn't say we, um, we, we believe in what was given just to Jesus and, and you've lost it. It's saying we believe what, what, what was revealed to you, right? It's, it's talking about what you're meant to believe in now. So Muslims are meant to believe the Bible. Uh, and look at these verses. If you, Muhammad, are in doubt as to what we sent down to you, Ask those who recited the scripture before you. And, and again, and before you also the apostles uh, we sent were but men to whom we granted inspiration. If you do not realize this, ask those who possess the message. See, even Muhammad was commanded to consult the Bible to show that the Quran is true. Now that's amazing, isn't it? I don't know what happened there. Let's uh, not have that happen again. They say, if only he would bring a miracle from his Lord. Has not there come unto them the proof that is in the former scriptures? So here we see that the Meccans are to consult the Bible to confirm that the Quran is true. Are you who have been given the scripture? Believe, who's writing on my screen? 
can, can you please stop someone writing on my screen? Are you who have been given the scripture? Believe in what we have sent down the Quran confirming what is with you. Christians, so Christians can know that the Quran is true because it confirms the Bible. Those who follow the messenger, the Muhammad, the, the prophet of his community, whom they will find mentioned in the Torah and the gospel in their possession. So here we see that Christians and Jews can read the Bible to see that Muhammad is foretold. If that's just being told for Muhammad's time, then these verses are irrelevant to, 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 to everyone today. But if the Quran is speaking forever, then these verses must be relevant now. Now, I just want to read from an Islamic scholar from Abdullah Zayed from Melbourne University, from the Islamic school there. And he sums this up. He says, since the authorized scriptures of the Jews and Christians remain very much today as they existed at the time of the prophet, it is difficult to argue that the Quranic references to Tarat and Injil are, were only to the pure Torah and Injil as existed at the time of Moses or Jesus, respectively. If the texts have remained more or less as they were in the seventh century, the reverence the Quran has shown them at that time should be retained even today. Many interpreters of the Quran from Tabari to Razi and Ibn Tamiya and even Qatab appear to be inclined to share this view. The wholesale dismissive attitude held by many Muslims in the modern period towards the scriptures of Judaism and Christianity does not seem to have the support of either the Quran or the major figures of Tafsir. So I, there are Islamic scholars in universities who completely agree with what I'm saying here. Now, I want to look at can, uh, God's, the fact that the Quran says God's word cannot be changed. So let's look at this here. And, and again, it's about Muhammad asking. Um, we only, so this is actually the third time that Muhammad is told to ask the Christians and the Jews. We only sent as messengers before you, Muhammad, men whom we inspired. Ask the people of the reminder, if you do not know, we have sent down to you a scripture in which is your reminder. So Muhammad is to ask the Christians and Jews about their reminder, and then he is being given his own reminder. So notice here, the Bible's being called the reminder. Muhammad is to consult the Bible, and then he is given his own reminder. And often Muslims will quote, quote to Christians, Surah 15, verse 9, and they'll say, well, the promise, uh, Allah has promised to preserve the Quran, uh, but he hasn't promised to preserve any other book. But look at this promise to preserve the book. We have indeed sent down the reminder and we shall guard over it. Now, what is the reminder? Well, the reminder is one of the titles for the Bible and it's a title for the Quran. So Allah's promise to guard the reminder is actually a promise to regard, uh, to, to, to guard his scripture. So there's, no, there's nothing in the Quran about the scriptures being corrupted. The promise is Allah will actually guard them. Uh, and let's see, the, the final one is in, um, uh, is in Surah 6, verse 114 and 15. He who has sent down to you the scripture set out distinctly. The word of your Lord is perfect in truth. There is no one who can change his words. So you see when it talks about no one who can change his words, if you read the verse just before it, you'll see that it's actually referring to scripture. Now, so what is the Torah and the gospel in the Quran? What is the Torah and the gospel in the Quran? Well, we need to just look at the context of Muhammad's life because the Quran revolves and evolves around Muhammad's life. And who are the people with the scriptures in Muhammad's life? Well, it's the scriptures of the Jews and the Christians from at least the Roman world, because we know Muhammad had interaction with the Roman world and the Quran is always talking about the Romans. There's a whole chapter given to the Romans. So it must be Roman Christians. It's talking about uh, Arab Christians from Yemen uh, and from the Nadrain uh, who believe that Jesus was the son of God. So we know what scriptures they had. It talks about Ethiopian Christians and we know that Muhammad and many of the other Muslims uh, were refugees in Ethiopia. And we know exactly what Bible the Ethiopians had at that time. And so we actually know what these scriptures are. It's the Bible that we have today. When the Quran is talking about the scriptures of the Christians and the Jews, 
we know exactly what those scriptures are because the Christians are identified in the Quran. They're the Roman Christians, Arab Christians, Ethiopian Christians, and we know what their scriptures are. We still have them. And then, of course, there's the Jewish believers, and we know what the Jewish, uh, the, the Jewish Torah is. Uh, in fact, up until recently, the Jews were still living in Yemen and they had their Torah. And you can actually go and see the Torahs from Yemen, uh, which they had been passing down there. And it's the same Torah that we have today. So we actually know what the Torah is that the Quran is referring to. And we know what the gospel and the, 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 the Christian scriptures are that the Quran is referring to. Because you see, Christians just call, uh, the, the Arab Christians just call the New Testament, the Injil. That's just what they call it. Some Christians in English, we call it the New Testament, the Old Testament. Other people call it the New Covenant, the Old Covenant. So it goes by different names at different times. And what we just see is that the Quran is using some of the common names that, are, that even Jesus himself used. Because when Jesus described the Bible, he just called it the Law of Moses, the Psalms, oh, sorry, the Law of Moses, the Books of the Prophets, and the Psalms. That's how he described the Bible at his time in Matthew 24. So I want to conclude now. In my presentation today, we began by looking at the context of the Quran. We saw that the people of the book um, are reciting their book in one language and explaining it to the Muslims in another. And so that is actually the context in which much of the discussion about the Christian scriptures is happening. And many of the complaints are from this process, from this process. We then read three surahs in context. Again, I didn't want to pick and choose just individual verses. I said, let's, let's do a whole thematic study on three major surahs of the Quran. And what we saw is that there were some Christians and Jews who were misrepresenting their scriptures when they were explaining them and translating them to the Arabic speaking peoples. And it seems that a hypocritical group of Jews and some Arabs around Medina were even writing these poor translations out and selling them for profit. But the Quran never says that the Bible is corrupted. It never, uh, it never says that it needs to be corrected or only parts of it are true. It never says the originals are lost. It actually says that the Jews and Christians have the scriptures of Moses and Jesus. The Christians and Jews are to follow their scriptures. Three times Muhammad is commanded to consult the Bible to know that the Quran is true. Christians can know that the Quran is true because it confirms the Bible. And Jews and Christians can read their Bible and see that Muhammad is foretold. The Quran says that the word of God cannot be changed. So if you accept the Quran, then there is no reason for you to reject the Bible. Now, I want to say, if there are differences between the Bible and the Quran, and you find that the Quran doesn't confirm the Bible and that Muhammad's not foretold in it, then please do not blame Christians and Jews for this. Don't blame us for this. This has got nothing to do with us. The Quran's the one making these claims. Please don't blame us if what the Quran says doesn't match up to what the Bible says. Right? Don't blame us for this. You need to take up this matter with Muhammad yourself. You need to have the courage to say, is what the Quran saying actually true? You need to ask that question. Thank you very much. Excellent. Uh, what I'm going to do now is we will start with the 15-minute rebuttal. So obviously, Samuel will go first, as we've mentioned. So, Samuel, do you want to have a minute to recollect yourself just quickly? <laughs> All right, well, uh, I want to thank you, Shubabe, for your presentation. And uh, I actually found it helpful to, to listen to those arguments and, and understand accurately what Muslims are saying in, in that regard. And uh, I want to give some general uh, overview statements first for, for um, what I thought of your presentation. I, I guess um, my first point is that I felt that you didn't really make the context of what the Quran is talking about when when it's talking about the bible you didn't really tell us what the context was in the way that i did so it was sort of showing different verses here and there while well, i've tried to show the whole context and i think it would have been helpful to have that just to put things in context um, 
Also, I think it, it, you haven't really let the Quran explain itself on these matters. And um, I think it's important that the Quran is allowed to explain itself. Uh, and finally, you know, you, you're saying that I'm deluded and uh, accusing me of those types of things. And so again, you know, you're blaming Christians for the, for the statements in the Quran not being true. And I just don't think it's fair to blame Christians for the statements in the Quran uh, not being seen to be true. I now want to move on to, to cover. You, you've made a whole lot of points. I'll see how I go. Uh, first of all, you said the Quran says nothing about the Bible and that the word Bible does not exist in the Quran or the Bible. Well, I'm just going to look at the Quran because that's what we're looking at today. Well, I want to say, yes, it does. Of course, the word Bible is in the Quran. The word Bible is just the Greek word for book. And in the Quran, Christians and Jews are called the people of the book. Every time you say people of the book, you are saying people of the Bible. In fact, one of the things um, you can do is you can go and get a Greek translation of the Quran. And I ask everyone to do this, get a Greek translation of the Quran. And you'll actually see that the Christians are called in the Greek translation of the Quran, the people of the Bible, because the word Bible just means book. So now the Quran actually defines for us what it means by the people of the book, because it gives different titles to their book. Sometimes it, uh, it calls it the Torah and the Injil in Surahs 3 and 5. But sometimes and very often it just talks about the books of the prophets and it just speaks about the books of the prophets in general, which that's actually what's in the, the, in the Bible, just the books of many, many prophets. Uh, it talks about the Psalms. And so, as I pointed out before, this is actually just how Jesus talks about the, the, the Bible. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. The Quran actually speaks about the Bible in the same way that Jesus does as the prophets, the law of Moses and the Psalms. Um, uh, now, you, you mentioned that the the uh, the the Injil of Jesus is not Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, I actually answered this in my presentation, but you know what I pointed out was that, yes, the Quran does not talk about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but when it talks about the Quran, it doesn't talk about the seven Ahruf. Uh, and so you just can't read the Quran. You've got to read according to one of the Quran'ats. So there is no such thing as just the Quran or one Quran. I've actually got, um, I've got three of the different Quran'ats here. So I've got three different Qur'ats here, and there's actually thousands of differences between them. They're not all the same recitations. And so the, the Qur'an doesn't talk about the Haruf or the different Qur'ats, so it doesn't give details. Um, now you said that the Qur'an does not confirm the Bible and the Torah, sorry, the, Bible, the Qur'an does not confirm the Bible, but it confirms the Torah and the Injil. I've already shown that they are just the common names and that the, the Christians who are in Muhammad's life were the Romans, Ethiopians, and Syrians, and Jews. And we actually know historically what their scriptures were. And Islamic scholars, as I quoted, agree with this. Now, you said that Jesus preached the gospel, and this is what the Quran's referring to, not Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And you gave a whole lot of references to uh, Jesus preaching the gospel. Well, I want to say, yes, Jesus certainly did preach the gospel, but um, you, you haven't really understood the gospel. because Jesus spoke the word of God, but he also, as just as important to his mission, was to display the power of God to prove his words. And he did this through his miracles. And so his miracles are actually integral parts to the gospel message. Without his signs, there is no gospel message. His signs and his words are one. You cannot separate them. And so Jesus says in John 9, verse 4, I must do the works of him who sent me. The Father sent Jesus to speak, but the Father sent Jesus to do works. And they are just as much part of the gospel as anything else. And Jesus gave his Holy Spirit to his apostles. Uh, we see this throughout um, the, in Matthew chapter 10 and in John chapter 20. Jesus gives his Holy Spirit to his apostles. So they are inspired prophets who wrote not just what Jesus said, but also what he did. And I'd also like to point out something here, that when the Quran talks about uh, the, the, the Christians, it, I'll just read to you from Surah 3, verse 55. It says, Behold, God said, O Jesus, I will take you and raise you to myself and clear you of those who blaspheme. I will make those who follow you superior to those who reject faith to the day of resurrection. 
So the Quran actually says that the Christians who are going to be successful to the day of resurrection are the true Christians. That's what it says. The, the Christians who are the who are the, the, the true Christians are the ones who are going to be successful to the day of resurrection. And who is that? Well, it's the church. It's, it's the, the church. There's nothing else we can say. Now, you said there were many different Christians with many different gospels. Well, I want to say, no, that's simply not true. Uh, there were different Christian groups, but most of them actually read exactly the same Bible. There were some different uh, gospels that people wrote, but you need to tell people about these. For instance, most of these other gospels were gospels in which creation was evil and God was not the creator. And so Jesus, because he was God and God can't touch or create anything because he's so transcendent, Jesus wasn't physical. Now that's what these gospels are. And you need to be honest and tell people what these gospels were because most of them that were teaching what's called docetism or Greek philosophy. And in Greek philosophy, God cannot touch creation. God's not the creator. God's not the sustainer. He doesn't connect with creation at all. Now, as Christians and Muslims, we don't believe that. We actually believe that creation is good and that God does connect. God creates, God sustains. You need to tell people what these other gospels were because they were rejected for good reasons. It's interesting though you brought up the Ebionites because the Ebionites actually used the gospel of Matthew which actually proves my point. Uh, you referred to them, but they used what's in the Bible. And in fact, they, they accepted the Old Testament. They followed the Old Testament. So again, you referred to the Ebionites, but they actually prove that they followed the Bible. They followed Matthew from the New Testament, and they followed the, uh, the, the Old Testament as Jews. Uh, but as I pointed out again, the gospels that are successful in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the gospels of the of the successful disciples and surah 3 verse 55 says that the followers of jesus the true followers of jesus will be the successful ones who are the successful ones well they're the ones that we have in the bible they're the one that succeeded so according to the quran the bible has the right gospels in it now you said that all uh, all gospel sorry all um, scholars agree that Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the Old Testament. I, I, I don't know any who would believe that. Some of them might say that, uh, the, that the Jews took ideas from the Babylonian captivity, but we know from Jeremiah the prophet that he never went into captivity and he took the Torah with the Jewish community with him down to Egypt. And so you can't say that Nebuchadnezzar destroyed all of the Torah because Jews went in other directions as well. They didn't just go to Babylon. Not all Jews went to Babylon when Jerusalem was destroyed. They went around to other parts of the world. And we read about that in the book of, um, in the book of Jeremiah. Now, you, uh, you quoted um, a, a hadith from the son of Ad-Darimi. And that was saying that if uh, it was Muhammad was saying that if there was any prophet today, that that prophet would follow him, that that prophet would follow him. And, uh, and not follow his own scriptures. But I just want to read out to you, and I may not, can I get this up on the slide again? Um, hang on, hang on. It, might, it might be quicker for me to get it this way. Let me just read to you from what I had. I said, so this is Surah, 50, uh, Surah 5, verse 48. It says, to each one of you, Jews, Christians, and Muslims, we have assigned a path, the Torah, the Gospel, or the Quran, and a way of action. Had God willed, he could have made you one community, but he has not done so that he may try you in what has come to you. So the Hadith you quote is actually in direct opposition to the Quran. The Quran actually says that God could have made us one community, but he hasn't. He's given us three different books and each community is called upon to be faithful to their own book. So that Hadith you quoted it is, is saying the opposite to what the Quran says. Now, um, point 10, you've said here that, uh, uh, I won't worry about that one. Uh, you're saying that the Quran is the last, you're saying the Quran is the last book and that the other books have been outdated, obsolete or abrogated. Well, I've actually already just showed that, haven't I? I've showed multiple times in my presentation that the Jews are told 
bring your proof from the scriptures. Bring your proof. Um, and so, and, and follow your book. You've got to follow all the scriptures. And God's made us in three communities. So there is no idea at all in the Quran about the Torah and the gospel being outdated, obsolete, or uh, abrogated. Now, you referred to uh, Surah 100, uh, Surah 5, verse, where's my Quran? Surah 5. Uh, surah 5 verse 1 uh, sorry surah 6 verse 115 and you said that when it refers to the word of your lord is perfect in truth and justice there is none of uh, no one who can change his words you said this is just talking about god's promises but if you actually read the verse before it actually talks about scripture shall i shall i seek any judge other than god for it is he who sent down to you the scripture set out succinctly and those who have already been given the scripture know that it is sent down from the Lord and do not be one of those who have doubts. The word of your Lord is perfect in truth and justice. There is no one who can change his words. So you quoted that verse, but if you just read the verse beforehand, the context is the scriptures. That's the context. That's the context in which it gives. So you need to read the verses in context, which I want to encourage everyone to do. Now, I've only got three minutes left and I might have to do this in my other thing. Uh, you said that Christians authored uh, the, 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 the books in the, sorry, Christians say that men authored the books in the Bible. Yes, we do say that because God inspires prophets and those prophets write down what they're inspired from God. And so uh, just as a prophet, uh, just as we might use a pen and there's a characteristic of that pen, it might have blue ink or something in it so too is the case with uh, how God speaks to us through prophets. There's a particular language they bring, a particular culture they bring. It, it, there's a human aspect to it, but there's a divine aspect to it. And that's all we're saying. We're not saying that they're not the word of God. Uh, you're saying that early Christians didn't consider the, uh, the, the New Testament as scripture. Well, that's simply false. That's simply false. Um, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 37, Paul is very clear in saying what I write to you is the Lord's command. And in 1 Corinthians chapters 1 and 2, Paul goes to great length explaining how God inspires prophets to speak and how God has inspired him to speak. So the Apostle Paul introduces his letters by saying, I am an apostle of God. That's how he introduces his letters. He is being very clear that he is writing scripture and he teaches people to treat it that way. And that's how the early Christians did. They shared Paul's letters and that's why we have them today. Now, you're also saying that Matthew didn't say that he was inspired. Well, Matthew said in chapter 10, verse 20, that he received the Holy Spirit. Jesus said that he was going to give the Holy Spirit to his disciples so that they could speak. And in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, uh, Jesus commands them to make his teaching known and to continue this prophetic ministry. And so Matthew does know that he's inspired and he's, he knows he's inspired by the Holy Spirit of God and that he's been commissioned by Jesus to take the gospel message to the world. Uh, you said that Moses, and I, how could Moses have written the, the Torah? How could Moses have, and I'll finish with this one. How could Moses have written the Torah? Well, uh, again, please just read what uh what the bible says because moses appointed joshua to come after him and this is what we read of joshua and joshua recorded these things in the book of the law of god then he took a large stone and set it up under the oak tree near the holy place of the lord so we see that moses had another prophet after him joshua and we're actually told that the law of moses was finished up by the next prophet after moses and so that is how Moses' death can be recorded in the Torah. So there's absolutely no problem. And th these verses you're bringing up have easy answers to them. And I want to encourage Muslims to, to look for these answers. Thank you very much. Time. Thank you so much, Samuel. On the dots, right on time. Dr. Seth, are you there? Unmuted. There we go. You're unmuted. Yeah. As soon as you want to start, you've got your 15 minutes and I'll start the clock for you. Okay, thank you, uh, Pastor Samuel Green, for your presentation and rebuttal. But uh, what I was wondering, that every time you use the Quran, you refer the Quranic verse, speaking about Torah and Injil, and you conclude from there, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, and you conclude from there that it is Bible. 
I wonder how can you conclude from Torah and Injil Bible? Then I then you later on explain people of the book is the people of the Bible. See, I explained to you book word is used in Quran in the meaning why not as a proper name. Bible is a proper name. Bible is a book by Genesis to Revelation is a proper name. It is not a proper name. Book, when it says people of the book, it refers to people of the book, the Ahle Kitab. Ahle Kitab is the people of the Torah and Injil. Even Torah and Injil is a book. Even Torah and Injil is a book. So referring to that, people of the book means people of the Torah and Injil. When the word Kutub is mentioned, Kitab is mentioned, it doesn't refer to the proper name Bible. In that case, if, we, if that is the case, let, let me give you a power presentation on that. Can you, can you just click on that? See. Yeah. Bible means books. Kutub in Arabic also means books. Kutub mentioned anywhere in Arabic literature cannot mean Bible everywhere. Wherever you mention Kutub everywhere, in newspaper, in any other book, the, wherever Kutub is mentioned, Kitab is mentioned, it means Bible. No. Because Kutub is mentioned meaning wise, it's common now, not a proper name. It will be ridiculous to mean Bible everywhere where Kutub, where Kitab is mentioned in Arabic literature. It will be ridiculous. For example, in chapter 98, verse number 3 in Quran, Fiha Kutubun Qayyama, within which are correct writings. For writings, the word is Kutub, Kitab, means Bible. So it is not the meaning, the, you cannot read the verse within which are correct Bible. You cannot read in the verse that within which are correct Bible. It would be ridiculous to mean Bible because Kutub is used, used as meaning wise, it's common noun, not mentioning wise, not a proper name. This is why I gave you explanation about proper names and uh, common nouns. Now in a similar way, reading is mentioned, is, is the meaning of Quran is means, means reading. Quran means in Arabic reading. So wherever reading is mentioned in English literature, everywhere, do you mean that everywhere Quran is mentioned? No, you cannot say Quran is mentioned. For example, Jeremiah chapter 36, verse number eight, Jeremiah the prophet commanded him, Reading in the book, the words of the Lord, in the Lord's house. This reading, do you mean for Quran then? Because re reading means Quran. It would be ridiculous to mean Quran because reading used here is meaning wise, not mentioning wise. So anywhere reading is mentioned in newspaper, any other book, that means Quran. No, this is wrong logic, wrong understanding. So people of the book doesn't mean people of the Bible. Bible is a proper name. People of the book is a common name, common noun referring to the books, Torah and Injil. It is not referring to any other book. It is not referring to Bible. You started in your slide that you should understand the context. You should understand the context. You should under the, understand the context. And the context you gave that the previous scripture was translated in the Arabic language. In Hebrew, the previous scriptures were in Hebrew and you translated in the Arabic language. Now, if you translate in Arabic language, what is the point? Does, does that mean it is Bible? How can you come to a conclusion that it is Bible? You quoted chapter 5, verse number 13, 15, and you said these are referring to oral explanation and translation of the Bible. How come you get the word Bible? So, chapter 5, Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse number 13, 15, 41, it doesn't use the word Bible. It explains certain things, but after, after explaining, you say these are referring to oral explanation and translation of the Bible. How come you get the word Bible? It is, it is very wrong. You are lying. Again, again, lying that it is Bible. Everywhere you use the same thing. You, everywhere you use the same thing. Chapter 5, verse number 43, 45. Jews have the Torah. How can Jews have, Jews have the Torah now? Jews had the Torah at the time of Prophet Muhammad. It is referring to time at the time of Prophet Muhammad. They had the Torah, they had the Injil. Today, Torah and Injil is not preserved, not intact. It is not available. 
it is lost. You, are, you don't have the Torah. You have no, Torah is one book. It is not five books. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Torah is one book. It is not five books. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So this, by this you easily come to know Torah is different book and the first four five book Pentateuch is a different book. Injil is one book revealed to Jesus Christ is upon him. In the Quran, Injil is one book revealed to Jesus Christ is upon him. Injil. It is not four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Four books. One book and four books. It's a different thing. And Injil was pre preached by Jesus in his, in his lifetime. He was preaching the Gospel. The Gospel. He was preaching the Gospel. What Gospel was he preaching? He was not preaching Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John comes in picture later in period. They are telling you about Jesus Christ, not what, Jesus, what was revealed on Jesus Christ. I quoted you a verse from chapter 12 of 49 and 50, that Jesus is speaking that I am not speaking of myself, but the Father which sent me, he has commanded me what to say and what to speak. So whatever God commands him, he speaks. And whatever God commanded him, that is the Injil we say. That body of literature, what was commanded to Jesus Christ, you do not have. We do not have today. It is lost. And I explained to you how it, lo it lost. Because people of the Injil, they had the Injil, they had the copy of the Injil, but when, when Islam reached them, they accepted Islam and there were groups of and Donatists, Malaysians, Arianism, Arianist, all these people, Unitarian Christians, they inhabited the northern part of the Africa, Tunisia, Donatists were, were populated in Tunisia and Algeria. They accepted Islam. And Algeria and Tunisia, they are Muslim. Egypt, Malaysians, they accepted Islam. And Egypt is full Muslim. So the people of the book, they accepted Islam. Once they accept Islam, they follow Quran and they don't follow Torah and Injil anymore. If the book is not followed, then it gets lost. This is how it got lost. Then you quote Surah Mahada, chapter 5, verse number 68. Same thing. The verse says Torah to Injil. From where you get the word Bible? You quoted 50 some verses. 50 verses you quoted from the Quran. But everywhere it says Torah to Injil, Torah to Injil, previous scripture, Torah to Injil, previous scripture. Previous scripture are the Torah to Injil. Torah to Injil are the scripture talked about. It is not the Bible. Bible is a different book. Bible is written by different books. It's a Jewish record. It is not. It is not. It is not the Torah and Injil. Then you quoted. Uh, you quoted chapter four, five, verse number forty-eight. Let me read out five forty-eight. Five forty-eight. You quoted saying that contradicts the Hadith. No, it doesn't contradict the Hadith. I am reading the last part, and we prescribed a law to each among you. Have we prescribed a law and an open way? If Allah had so willed. He would have made you a single people. But his plan is to test you in what he has given you. This is important. His plan is to test you in what has given you. What has been given to you is the Quran. So Allah is testing you in what he has given you, whether you follow the Quran or not. So you are supposed to follow the Quran. Read the whole verse, complete verse, then you will realize. Then you say, Chapter 3, verse number 78, 187. They twist, they hide, they twist, make profit from the scripture. It is referring to the oral explanation translation of the Bible. From where you got the word Bible? From where you got the Bible? Again, you're lying. You're, you're reading something else and your, your conclusion is something else. You're, you're making, giving, saying that it is Bible. It is, the word Bible doesn't exist in the Quran. The word Bible doesn't exist. The book book doesn't mean the Bible. Chapter three, verse number ninety-three says, "Bring the Torah and recite it from you." Tell if you tell if you tell the truth. Bring the Torah and recite it if you tell the truth. Prove your recite. To, bring the Torah means bring the Torah, not Bible. And you conclude, prove your belief from the Bible. You cannot make request that Bible is unreliable. How? The word Bible is not there in chapter 3 of number 93. Again, no distinction between, you should not make distinction between the books. Yes, you should not make distinction between Quran, Zabur, Torah, Injil. Not biblical books. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Acts, Galatians, Philippians, Corinthians. Not that book, not those books. 
you should not make distinction in the book of god not book of human being then you i don't know how much time is left can you tell me how much time is left for all Dr. the words four minutes so all the verses that you quote you quote torah and injil and previous scripture from there you conclude bible i fail to understand why you should conclude bible when the world verse doesn't say bible you should read what the, what is there in the quran you should not read what is not there in the quran you should not put words in the quran you can put words in the bible if you want you it is your to choice but you cannot put words in the quran the word quran do nowhere mentions the word bible then you say abdullah faith scholar today says that uh, uh, you should respect the torah and injil in a similar way the old testament and the new testament no it is his opinion tell abdullah said that moses in your torah so called torah he is telling you that he died after 120 years old when he when he was 120 years old he died at the age of 120 how can moses write 120 years old now you you say that he, Joshua wrote. Joshua, Joshua was cont contemporary. He was the assistant of Moses. This is not written by assistant of Moses because the verse says, let me read on. The verse says, yeah, the verse says that he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab or against Beth Peor. But no man knoweth, the, knoweth of his sepulchre unto his death. Nobody knows the sepulchre of this day. Why? 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 Nobody knows. If he was contemporary, he was in his time, in, during his time, he must have attended the funeral. He should know. Multitudes of people must have attended the funeral. And Moses was not a different, not a small person. He was a prophet of God. He was a famous person. Many people must have attended the funeral. Those people who attended the funeral, they must have died. And those in those days, people used to live 100 years. So after 100 years, Nobody is there to point out the grave of the person. So it has to be after 100 plus years. So it is not contemporary person writing. So it is written by somebody else after 100 years, not during the time of Prophet Moses or immediately after, like Joshua. Now quote him, tell Abdullah Sayyid that this is there in your Torah. How can you believe this? Quote, quote him Psalms chapter 137.9. Happy are those who shall, happy are those who dash their little children on rocks. How happy are those who dash their little children on rocks. How is it possible that God is saying that those people are happy who are killing children? This is impossible. Tell Abdullah Said, see your psalm say like this. Tell Abdullah Said in Genesis chapter 24, verse number one to four, Abraham is calling, saying of uh, uh, his eldest servant, put your hand under my thigh. Put your hand under my thigh to give me a promise that he will take my son, my wife for my son, Isaac. Put your hand under my thigh. What is under, under my thigh? In New, New Standard Bible Dictionary, Article 630, 630 in Encyclopedia Biblica, volume number 3, 3453 column, it says male generative organ. You put on Google, go to Jewish website, they will give you another word. They will give you another, another word, organ of circumcision. Tell your Abdullah Said that this is what is seven. Tell Abdullah Said that in Matthew chapter one, chapter three, chapter one, verse number seventeen, it says that in the genealogy that there are fourteen generations from Abraham to David, from David to deputation of Babylon, fourteen generations, from deputation of Babylon to Jesus, fourteen generations. Count it. It is not fourteen, fourteen, fourteen. It is fourteen, fourteen, thirteen. Tell him this is a blunder, giving a genealogy to a person who has no genealogy. Tell the person that in the second set is 14, but according to First Chronicles chapter 3, verse number 10, 12, and 16, 17, there are four names missing from the second set. There are four names missing from the second set. So if you put the four names back again in the second set, the second set will become 18. 14 plus 4, 18. So it is 14, 18, 13. Series of blunders in the Bible. Tell Abdullah Sayyid, revise your belief that Bible is the same book in the Torah and Jil. No, Bible is not the same book Torah and Jil. Time is up. Thanks, Doc. That's time. Oh, okay, you thank ended you. on time. Okay. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to give each speaker uh, another five minutes to reply. Obviously, the time will go to Samuel first, and then after that to Dr. Sayed. So, Samuel, I'm just going to cue my time. 
as soon as you start, I'll start your five minutes. Okay, so thank you for that, Shayu. Um, I guess the main point that you were saying to me is, how can I show that when the Quran talks about the people of the book, it's referring to the Bible? And so th that's the main point where I'll spend most of my time. Um, first of all, I agree with you that just because Arab, uh, just because Arabic literature writes the word kitab, it doesn't mean Bible. I, I agree with that. Uh, and just because the Quran uses the word kitab, it doesn't mean Bible. But that's where you need to read in context. Because if it, the word kitab does mean book, and so you need to read in context to see which book is it talking about. Now, when we do that, we see that it's talking about the book of the Christians and the Jews, that's just what it's called. The people of the book are the people of the Christians and the Jews. And what is their book? Well, their book is their scriptures. And as I pointed out, the Quran actually gives some of the names in the, in, at that culture, the common category names of Torah, books of the prophets, the Psalms and the gospel. They are just the common category names that Christians give to their scriptures. And I gave you uh, Luke tw chapter 24 uh, as an example where Jesus uses those exact categories. So when it says the people of the book, the Quran then defines what books those are and it gives the categories of scripture that Christians and Jews mean for the books in the Bible. So that's why I'm saying the word uh, people of the book is referring to the Bible because that's just how the Quran defines it. Uh, and we know who these that these people were because the Quran talks about Roman Christians. We know of the Ethiopians in Muhammad's life, the Syrian Christians, when he was a trader, he was going up there. And we know what these scriptures were. In fact, we've got scriptures from these places from that time. So we know exactly what those scriptures were. And they're just the Bible that we have today. So there's simply no reason to go saying it was just a scripture at Muhammad's time. It never says that. It never just says, it's just at Muhammad's time. It just says it's the scripture of the Christians. And as I said, it defines the Christians as the Jews, the Ethiopians, sorry, the, 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 the Romans, the Ethiopians, the Syrians, all those people we know in Muhammad's life. And we know what their scriptures are. So there's simply no reason to say it's not uh, referring to the Bible. Now, you said that the Torah uh, is one book. It's not uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. Uh, well, again, and, and you also said that the Injil is not the four Gospels. Well, again, as I pointed out, the Quran doesn't give details any further. It just speaks in general terms of the Torah and the Gospel. And so, for instance, and the, the example I gave was of itself. As you know, you don't simply get uh, the, the Quran. There are many different Qurans. If you want to read the Quran, you have to choose one of the Qur'ans. And... Um, I pointed out that I've got three of the Qur'ats here. And so you have to choose the Qur'an according to um, Imam Hafs, the Qur'an according to Imam Warsh, or the Qur'an according to Imam al juri You've actually got to choose which one you're going to read. Now, does the Qur'an talk about, does the Qur'an talk about all of those? No, it doesn't. It doesn't describe itself in that way. It doesn't describe the Bible in that de detail either. So you can't say it's rejecting Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John when it doesn't even give that type of detail. Now, you mentioned that the people in North Africa converted to Islam and they were Unitarians. Well, they actually had exactly the same Bible that we have. The point is they were most likely, some of them may have been Aryans or monophysites, but they have exactly the same Bible. But North Africa in the sixth, seventh century, we know what Bible they had. They had the Bible we have. It was the Bible of the Byzantine Empire. So we know exactly what it is, which proves my point. And let's see. Um, now, you, you said that I have mis mistrans I, 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 mis I mistranslated Surah 5, verse 48, because you said that you have to, uh, each person, each community has to go by what has been given. And you said, well, what has been given is the Quran. But if you just read the verse beforehand, it says, let the people of the gospel judge by what God has sent down in it. And so he's very clear what Christians are to obey. Christians are not to obey the, the Quran. They're meant to believe it in the same way Muslims are meant to believe in the, in the gospel. But they, the Christians are meant to follow the gospel which Jesus gave them and they have. 
Um, you said that Abdullah Zaid, I think I'm out of time there, so I'll finish up. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Samuel. You've, you, you're absolutely right. You're on time. Uh, over to Dr. Seth. Doc, it, as soon as you start, uh, I will start your five minutes as well. Uh, again, I say that uh, that explanation is not valid, that people of the book means people of the Bible. I explain you in detail that Bible is a common noun, Bible is a proper name, Kutub is a common noun, Ahle Kitab is a common noun. It is, it is meaning why. So you cannot mean the Bible. Ahle Kitab, people of the book, referring to the people of Torah and Injil, because Quran regularly speaks about Torah and Injil. So Torah, Torah revealed to Prophet Moses is upon him. That Torah is Ahle Kitab. People of the Injil, that people of the Injil, Injil is the revelation given to Moses, Jesus is upon him. So it is speaking about Ahle Kitab, referring to Torah and Injil and the book, not Bible. It doesn't say Bible. Why Quran does not say Bible? Because Bible was 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 coined before Quran. Quran well, Bible was used by Christians by before Quran. So Bible word came into existence before. Why Quran is not using the Bible? Bible word is not used. Bible, Quran is not referring to Bible. Then you say that 548. I'm you are again reading, but 548 it speaks about that this is a test for this is a trial. You have to test. You have to read the whole Quran. Quran says in chapter 2 of 137 about the Jews. Fain amanu If they believe the way you believe, the way you believe means the way the companion, companions of the Prophet they believe. If if fain amanu amantum bi then they are on the right path. Then they are then they are guided. Fain tawalla fain nama hum But if they if they turn back, then they are on the wrong path. And Allah is enough for them, Allah is hearing and knowing. So it says that if you believe the way the companions believe, then you are guided. Otherwise, you are not guided. You are on the wrong path. So everywhere, I repeat, the word Bible doesn't exist in the Quran. The word Bible doesn't exist in the Bible. The word Bible is not there. So you cannot have anything mention about Bible is such a thing, Bible is that a thing, because the word Bible doesn't exist in the Quran. So it is wrong to say that Bible, the word Quran says uh, some, anything about the Bible. It is wrong. So Alhamdulillah, you spoke about different Kirat. Kirat is different thing. Kirat is not a detail. See, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John is not detail. It is a biography of Prophet Jesus. It is different thing. Prophet Jesus who preached the gospel was a different body of literature that was revealed to Jesus Christ was upon him. So that is different thing. Matthew, Mark, Luke and John is not the detail of what, what was revealed to Prophet Jesus. Prophet Jesus was revealed in Injil. Injil he preached. So I'm, talk, I'm telling Injil was revealed to Jesus. We believe in the Injil of Jesus. We don't believe in Injil of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Different Kirat is a different style of recitation. Different style of recitation cannot be there in the Quran. Different style of recitation can be de can be developed gradually and gradually. Even today, it can develop because many people are reciting Quran in a different way. My son, who is a Quran hafiz, he also recites in a beautiful fashion in an in international way. Alhamdulillah, Quran recitation it is not a detailed explanation. So, kirat is different thing. You can ha you can have many karis, many kirat reciting the Quran in different way. There are different Qurans in a kirat form. See, Warsh Quran, Hafs Quran, that is already established with Prophet Muhammad. We go back to Prophet Muhammad. All the Kirat go to back to Prophet Muhammad. And now, if they go, all go back to Prophet Muhammad, then it is valid. It is accepted. You can read the, any Quran. All Quran is similar. It is similar. It is same. It is not different Quran. It is not like Bible. It is not Roman. It is not like versions of the Bible. You have Roman Catholic version having 73 books. You have Protestant Bible having 66 books. It is not of different translation. Seven books are extra there in the Roman Catholic. Seven books are missing in the in the Protestant Bible. So Alhamdulillah, we have no no problem. We don't have like that in the Quran. Quran is the, having 114 surahs throughout. All the Quran have 114 surahs. We don't have less number of surahs in any any Quran you pick up. 
Simla case is not in the Bible. You have many, many books in the Bible, different. 78, some have 78 books, some have 75 books. You have different versions of the Bible. So it is not like the Quran. It's time up. You've got nine seconds, Doc. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but that was good. Very okay. well done. So I, well I, I, I conclude that Quran doesn't say anything about the Bible. Thanks so much, Doc. Well, uh, there's only one question that I can see that is submitted so far. So if you want to submit any question, you are welcome to address who the question is to. Um, you can address it to both Samuel or Dr. Syed. And then you can submit your question in the chat. Uh, gents, if I can give you two minutes maybe to answer. And Sam, if, for instance, if you reply, maybe a minute in response, if you, if you want to clarify that. Like I said, there's only one question so far. So if there are not any other questions, then we will move on to the closing remarks. But Doc, uh, there's a question addressed to you. Oh, there's another one that is also just submitted. Uh, I'll give you two minutes to answer this one. Let me quickly read it to you. Question to uh, Shweb Syed. If Allah was not powerful enough to preserve the Torah or Injil of Jesus, then how can we trust the Allah that he has preserved the Quran? Uh, quite a common question. You can start your two minutes. He, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot, it is not that he cannot preserve the Torah and Injil. He did not want to preserve the Torah and Injil. There were 313 revelations of God. Likulli ajin kitab, for every period God has given revelations. There is no point of having all the revelations preserved and intact. There is no point of having all the revelations preserved and intact. What is the use of all the revelations? So it is not that Allah cannot do that. Allah can do that. But Allah did not see fit to preserve the previous scripture. Allah has sent the last revelation to be the last revelation for all time. And he has taken promise in the Quran chapter 15 verse number 9. We have revealed the message and we will assuredly guard it from corruption. That was short and sweet. Sam, do you want to uh, start with a minute maybe and give an answer as well? Sorry, you're muted. Still muted. Hold on. Can you just unmute yourself? Sorry, I didn't hear you. Yes. Um, I think it's a great question to say um, why wouldn't Allah preserve the other books if he hasn't if he's going to just preserve the Quran why not preserve the others as I tried to show in my presentation um, there is nothing at all suggesting in the Quran that the other books were now superfluous and just not needed and so you only need one book again I encourage people to read Surah 5 uh, verses you know from 45 onwards to see that these books are meant to be valid. Bring your proof if you have proof. I've been trying to show that tonight. There's not much more I can really say. Thank you, Sam. That is good. Uh, a question directed to Samuel. You've got two minutes to answer. The question is straightforward. It says, Pastor, please quote any tafsir which says kitab refers to Bible. Do you know of anything like that? Well, um, tonight I haven't quoted tafsir uh, because the question was, what is the Quran saying? And so I've just limited myself to uh, showing what the Quran says. But I do want to say that I quoted from that Islamic scholar from Melbourne University who referred to all the tafsirs. And so I would refer you back to, to him. So that's Abdullah Zaid, and he does a big survey of the tafsirs. And so that's that was sort of how I wanted to give, you know, a tafsir input there by quoting um, the scholar. Now, hang on, can I find his reference? Or I'll be able to find it in time. That's the question, isn't it? Um, there's so many Just notes around here everywhere. I may not... I've got so many papers all over my desk. I can't find it now. It's, it's just out of control here on my desk. Um, but you, you saw the quote that I gave where he said that the dismissive attitude that Muslims have towards the Bible is not warranted from, from, the, from the writers of Tafsir. And he referred to Sayyid Qatub, uh, uh, Tabari. Um, uh, I can't remember the others now. So um, I gave a quote of, of that. I'll leave it at that. 
Excellent. Thank you so much. Doc, you've got a minute if you want to reply on that. Yes, I said that uh, if uh, Abdullah Saeed, he has an opinion that he should respect, it is his opinion. But I will say that Abdullah Saeed, please read that Moses is speaking about that he was 120 years old when he died. How can you believe such a Torah? How can you believe that Abraham is asking his elder servant to put, put your hand under my thigh and catch my genital organ to give me a promise? How can you believe such a thing is a Torah? How can you have contradictions in the Torah? How can you have pornography in the Torah? How can you have such things? So after saying these things, I believe Abdullah Said will revise his, belief, he revise his opinion. Okay, Doc. Sam, you've got maybe a minute if you want to comment on that. Um, well, oh, well, no, no, he, he, he was replying to mine. So th that's the end of it, isn't it? So I answered and then he gave a reply. So I can't hear. I can't hear you, Rudolph. Sorry. I, I, there we go. Uh, I answered. I, think, no I, I thought that was the questioning. That's all. Okay. No problem. Uh, to Dr. Schwab, uh, a question that is addressed to you. It's very lengthy, so I'm going to read it. It says it's a big assumption to say that the Torah and Injil have been completely lost, while the Quran was well preserved. This makes no sense in terms of the histor historical authenticity of the Torah, Injil, and Quran. I would encourage Muslims to investigate further. Uh, in a court of law, this is like saying to the judge, all my evidence is perfectly preserved, uh, whereas my opponent's evidence is completely lost. This sounds unbelievable. Christians and Muslims will struggle to believe this position. Would you agree? What is the question? Doc, if you want to comment on that, what, or what, not, what the question, you? the question about the preservation of Torah and Injil. If Allah That's wanted great. to preserve all the revelation, He could preserve all the revelation today. But what is the point of preserving all the revelation? Allah, Allah did not see fit to preserve all the revelations because all the revelation that was sent before it was for that period of time and for those people it was not meant for eternity. Allah sent the Quran, the last revelation for eternity, for all time. So therefore Allah has taken the promise in the Quran chapter 15 verse number 9 that I will, I have sent the Quran and I will definitely preserve it from corruption. So Allah has taken the promise to preserve the Quran. Allah has not given the promise to preserve all the scripture. Allah, Allah said in chapter 2 verse number 106 that I can substitute another revelation, previous revelation. I, there is a substitute, you talk about substituting the previous revelation. If previous revelation are substituted, that means the previous revelation becomes null and white. You are not supposed to follow. After accepting Islam, then you follow Quran. After you follow Quran, then you do need not follow any other book. And if you don't follow any other book, it gets lost. So this is the answer that how the Torah and Injil got lost. Okay, Doc, thank you so much for a succinct answer. Uh, Samuel, do you want maybe a minute to comment on that? Um, so, I mean, I agree with the question that it's a big ask for Christians, that if you, if you go into a, law, a court of law and say, my evidence is perfect, but everybody else's is corrupted, um, you know, you're just sort of setting up to get the answer that you want. And I've just tried to show again and again that the Quran never says that it's, it's, uh, it's here to replace the other scriptures. It just doesn't say that. Chapter 5, verse 46 onwards, is just saying that there are three paths and people have got to follow their own path. Each is meant to believe the scriptures of each other, absolutely. But there are these different paths that it has there. And so, um, it, you know, uh, um, Shayub was saying that, uh, you know, books that aren't used just get corrupted and fall away. The Bible's been used. N n nobody stopped using the Bible. We're, we're always using them. So, we haven't stopped using them, so they haven't they haven't fallen away or become corrupt because we've stopped using them. Because we're, we're always using them, we're still using them today. Time, okay. Uh, next question addressed to Samuel. Uh, a question that I'm going to fuse with somebody else's question. That's a little bit more direct. First one is a little bit nebulous, but I'm going to give you the details after I've read the question. If the Bible is God's word, why does it have uh, verses which are contradictory, pornographic in nature, or absurdities? Let me give you, give you an example. How could a loving God command these chosen people to kill babies and children, like Dr. Seat mentioned, 
uh, for instance, is it in Isaiah 13, 16, and such. I'm not sure. I think that's probably the Psalms. Psalms 13, 137, 13. Ah, there you go. Thanks for the clarity, Doc. Doc, uh, over to Sam. Sam, you want to comment on that? Okay. Um, well, I would say that it doesn't have contradictions. And so you just need to get up and look at the answers that Christians give. This is a famous thing that Muslims do because the Quran does not confirm the Bible, because Muhammad is not foretold in the gospel and the Torah, Muslims have a choice. They can either blame Christians or say Muhammad's not true and it's easier to blame Christians. And so that's what happens. And so they say the Bible's terrible. Look at this, look at that. And um, now, when you, well, first of all, um, Psalm 137 and killing children, it actually doesn't say to kill children. What it's talking about is the Babylonians who destroyed Jerusalem. So that is like idol worshippers coming and destroying Mecca. What would you say to the idol worshippers if they came and defiled Mecca? Would you say blessing on their children? You wouldn't say that, would you? Well, that's what it's like. That's what Psalm 137 is reflecting. It's not saying to do it. It's saying this is how the people feel. Now, when you keep reading, you actually see that the Babylonians in time will be saved and receive God's mercy. But as they are used as God's judgment, the Jews, you know, hate it, hate what's happening with the judgment. And uh, they, they, they don't bless their children. They curse their children. Now, um, uh, I'm sort of losing my track now. Now, all, all the pornographic stuff, it's not pornographic. It's simply not pornographic. So, for instance, in Ezekiel, I think it's uh, Ezekiel 22 or somewhere where it, it talks about the, the adulterous daughters and, uh, and everything. That is actually a description of our sin. It's a description of the vulgarity of our sin and how vulgar our sin is. And, you know, if you don't think it's a, a correct description, then you probably think you're not much of a sinner. You probably think you're a pretty, pretty good person and that, that that doesn't describe your sin. The other thing I would say also is the Quran is the one that describes paradise as women with large breasts and virgin women being given to men. And the Hadith talks about men having everlasting erections and all this type of stuff. So if you're going to talk about the Bible that way, please have a look at your own book and Hadiths. That's two minutes. I'll finish. Thanks so much. Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. Doc, if you want a minute to reply on to that question. Well, it doesn't say that you after saying that it's not saying killing the children. Psalms chapter 37, 137, verse 9 says, Dash happy are those who dash their little children on rocks. What will happen if you dash little children on rocks with their skull on the rock? They will die. So I'm not talking about who are those people, Babylonian or which, which people. I'm asking. How can anyone be happy by killing children? Who can make such a statement? Happy are those who dash their little children. Who can make such a statement? For as a, it should be a crazy man who can, who can say such a thing. I don't think God of the Bible is a crazy person. No, no it's a, God forbid. No, it's not a crazy person. How can it be that dash their little children on rocks? So pornographic material, what I quoted from Genesis chapter 24, verse number one to four, Abraham is asking his elder servant, put your hand under my thigh. What is under my thigh? Catching the genitive organ. Go on Jew Jewish website, they will tell you organ of circumcision. What is this? To give a promise, if you, are, if you want to have a promise from your daughter that you will marry such a such person, you should not marry such a such person, put your hand under my thigh. Will you do that? No, mm -hmm. it is not, it is not, you will not do that. So such pornographic material, you can say this is Torah. Thanks, Doc. Went a little bit over, so I'm going to give Samuel four more hours. Now I'm just teasing. <laughs> Here's a last uh, question that we can pose to Samuel. Uh, I hope you catch the Samuel. It is a more of a comment, but I will still allow it. Uh, just to be fair, then there were equal uh, questions given. As a Muslim, uh, Quran mentions that Torah uh, and Injil are corrupted, but still some elements of truth present. That's why we still quote the Bible to prove that matches the Quran because Quran is Furqan or Criterion. Whereas as Christians and Jews, you don't believe in Muhammad and thus don't believe in the Quran. There's no logical or moral right to use the Quranic proof. Maybe the question is more, why don't Christians use uh, uh, the Quran as the Furqan as Muslims do? Okay, so as I pointed, as I pointed out tonight, the Quran in no way says that the Bible is corrupted. It just, it doesn't say the Torah and the gospel are corrupted. It just does not say that. And I've, I, you have to show me some verses to say that because I went through and showed that that's not the case. 
Um, so it, it, it's, it's not corrupted. It doesn't say that. The, why is it that Christians, uh, and, and, but the result for Muslims is, and, and I want you to think about this, Muslims pick and choose as they read the Bible, right? They pick and choose. Now, that's actually the worst way to read a book, just to pick and choose which bits you want, right? The Quran actually says to Christians and Jews, do not pick and choose. Believe the whole thing. So that's what the Quran is commanding Christians and Jews. And I showed that again and again in my presentations tonight. So it never says the Torah and the gospel are corrupted or replaced or anything like that. It tells Christians not to pick and choose. Muslims pick and choose. Now, why is it that Christians don't uh, follow the Quran? Well, because the Quran says it confirms the Bible. But when you read the Quran, it doesn't. The Quran says Muhammad's foretold in the gospel and the Torah. But when you read it, he's not. And so we're not going to believe it. If what it says is not true, we're not going to believe it. And when Muslims just blame us for what Muhammad said, well, don't blame us for what the Quran says. Don't blame us for what Muhammad says. You take that up with Muhammad. If the Quran confirms the Bible, then good. If it doesn't, don't blame Christians. Stop blaming us. Right? Stop saying, oh, you're, you're delusional or something like that. Don't blame us. You go and look at the Quran yourself. Have the courage to say, is the Quran true? That, that's, that's how I'd answer that question. Okay, thank you so much, Doc. You want to answer in a minute, maybe? Sorry, you're muted, Doc. So just unmute. Just hold on, Doc. Just unmute yourself. Thank you. Yeah. One I, minute. Yes. I, I said in the beginning that the Quran doesn't say anywhere anything about the Bible. It doesn't say that Bible is corrupted. It doesn't say Bible is preserved. Quran doesn't say anything about the Bible. Quran is speaking about the Torah, the Injil. Quran is not speaking about the Old Testament and New Testament. It, Quran is not speaking about Bible. So it is very clear. Bible is corrupted, I can prove from the Bible. Bible is corrupted, I can prove from the Bible. There are many contradictions, the pornographic material, absurdities, the violence, full of violence. So you, you can have in the, in, the, in the Bible way, many such things. So I can prove that Bible is corrupted from the biblical point of view, not from Quran. Quran is not saying anything about the Bible. Okay. Thank you so much, Doc. Uh, now, what we're going to do is, is we're going to give a four minute for everyone to close. First to Dr. Syed, uh, we're going to give him four minutes to make his concluding arguments and to close uh, with his presentation. And then we'll hand it over to Samuel. Doc, as soon as you start, I will start your four minutes. Okay. Okay. Samuel Green and Pastor Rudolf Boshov, thank you so much for hosting this uh, show. And Alhamdulillah, I... Gave, I gave me in my presentation a very clear cut view that Quran doesn't say anything about the Bible because the word Bible doesn't exist in the Quran. The word Bible doesn't exist in the Bible too. So the word Bible is not in existence in the Quran. So the idea that Al Kitab means the book, book means uh, book means Bible, that is absolutely wrong because book is a common noun. Bible is a proper name. You cannot put proper name into common noun, taking common noun as a proper name. That is wrong, uh, absolutely wrong. So this debate, the topic was, what does the Bible say about, what does, what does the Quran say about the Bible? The answer is very clear. Quran doesn't say anything about the Bible. Quran is very clear. Quran says anything about the Bible. If you say that Bible is the Torah and Injil, how can it be Torah and Injil? How can Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse number 5, 6, and 7, talk about Moses died when he was 120 years old. Moses died when he was 120 years old. How can Moses write this? Moses cannot speak like this. Somebody else, after 100 years or 200 years, somebody else is speaking like this. So it is not from Moses. If it is not from Moses, how can you say that this is Torah? How can you say it is Torah? Now, you Christian, you tell us that Bible is authored by 40 different human authors. You tell us that they are human authors. I am saying Torah and Injil was revealed by God. It is, it is a revelation from God. It is authored by God. So Torah and Injil is a different thing from Bible. Bible is a human book. 
Torah, the Injil is a revelation from God. So it is a different thing. So don't mix up with that. When Jesus was preaching the gospel, he was preaching the gospel that was revealed on him. When he said, John chapter 5 verse 30, I can of my own self do nothing as I hear, I judge. What he was hearing from whom? He was not hearing from Tom, Dick and Harry. He was hearing from God. So whatever he heard from God, that is the Injil. In chapter 12 verse number 49, he says, the word that you hear is not mine, but Father which sent me. He has given me a commandment. What should I say? What should I speak? And the, and the commandment is life everlasting. Whatever I say, whatever I speak, as the Father has sent me, said to me, so I speak. So he makes it very clear that Injil was revealed to him. The message was revealed by God. Whatever he preached, that was the Injil. That preaching, that Injil was with Jesus Christ is upon him. When after 35 to 40 years, after Mark gospel according to Mark comes into existence. That gospel is a different gospel. Luke is a different gospel. Matthew is a different gospel. John is a different gospel coming later in picture. So it is not the same. Jesus preached the gospel. That gospel is not Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Don't mix up. When you use the word gospel, you say gospel, gospel of Jesus. Gospel of Jesus is gospel of Jesus. But in New Testament, you have gospels, not singular gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John Gospels. So it is not true. How can you say that it is a true gospel, true teaching true gospel when you have Paul is lying? I quoted, I explained to you how Paul is lying that it is according to the scripture. It is not there, it is this is not there according to the scripture. That statement that he will rise again from the third day, he will rise again after third day, after death. This statement is not there. And it is not possible to have such a statement in Jewish scripture. Because Jews believe anyone put on cross is, is cursed. Anyone put on cross is cursed. How can this cursed person will be glorified and coming back to life again? So this statement is not in the Jewish scripture. So Paul is lying. John is lying. Luke is lying. How can you attribute such lies to Injil? So this is not Injil. This is human book. I hope this concludes. Thanks so much, Doc. We went about 20 seconds over, so I'll afford Samuel the same 20 seconds. Samuel, over to you for your closing statement. If you would like, I don't see on top. Ah, there you are. Uh, if you start to speak, I will then just start your time. Okay, I'd like to thank everyone who's been involved tonight. Thank you, Rudolph, for organizing it and Shayab for making clear the Islamic position for us. Uh, I appreciate what you've said and you've helped me to understand the Islamic position better. Now, I just want to summarize what I said. I said that we need to understand the context of the Quran, and that is that the people of the book are reciting the Quran, uh, their, their scriptures in one language, and it's being translated into Arabic for the people of Arabia. And that this is actually the main issue that the Quran is talking about when it's making critical issues of Christians. We looked at three particular surahs, surahs uh, five, three, and two, and we saw that there were some Jews and Christians, some who misrepresent their scriptures and uh, explain and translate them falsely. But these were only a hypocritical, the, the, but the, the, these are only a small group, and there's a hypocritical group who were doing it. They in no way represent all Christians, and it never says all Christians were doing this. In fact, the Quran says that the Bible is not corrupt. It never says it's corrupt. It says that Allah protects his word. It's, it doesn't say it needs to be protected. It never says that only parts of it are true. It never says that the originals are lost. Uh, the Jews are commanded and Christians are commanded to follow their scriptures. And three times Muhammad is commanded to consult the Bible to know that the Quran is true. Christians can know that the Quran is true because it confirms the Bible and Jews and Christians can read their Bible to see that Muhammad is foretold. That is overwhelmingly the Quran is positive towards the Bible. Now, Dr. Shayeb has said that, oh, sorry, and also the Quran says that the word of God can't be changed. And I gave several examples of where that uh, happens. Now, Dr. Shayeb has said that the word Bible doesn't automatically mean Quran. Sorry, the word kitab, book, doesn't automatically mean 
Bible. And as I've said, I agree with that. We need to let the Quran explain itself. And when it does explain itself, it says it's the, the, the book of the Christians and the Jews is the Torah that is with them or the gospel that is with them or the Psalms that are with them or the books of the prophets. It doesn't just talk about Torah and gospel. It also talks about Psalms and and the books of the prophets. It, it's saying there's a whole range of books there, which is what we find in today's Bible. There's about 40 or you know 66 different books. And um, uh, Dr. Shayeb was saying that, you know, there's the Catholic canon and the Protestant canon. Well, the early collections of the Quran had different canons too. Not all Qurans had 114 surahs. Abdullah ibn Masud's Quran, we know for sure from the scholars, had 110 surahs. He didn't accept the last two as being scripture. Uh, Abdullah ibn Masud's Quran had 116 surahs. So the Quran had different canons as well, different numbers of surahs. And in fact, it wasn't until the fourth century when the different Qur'ats were chosen and 10 of them were canonized. Until that time, there, every region had its own Qur'at and these had to be canonized and 10 were accepted. So um, the, the Dr. Shayeb's way of, uh, of, of attacking the Bible and just saying, look at this contradiction or look at this and putting the hand under the thigh, all of those examples he were giving were actually irrelevant. They were completely irrelevant because the question tonight is, what does the Quran say about the Bible? It's not, do you think the Bible's got stuff in it you don't like? That's irrelevant. There's things in the Quran that people don't like. There's things in the Quran about beating your wife into submission that people don't like, cutting off hands that people don't like. Most Muslims don't practice most of the Quran because they don't like it, right? So those examples of saying, well, the Quran, sorry, the Bible has this and we don't like it, that doesn't mean anything. The question is, what does the Quran say? And I'm saying the Quran says the Bible is the inspired word of God that Christians and Jews are to refer to and that uh, Muslims are meant to make no distinction about and believe along with the Quran. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much to both of you. Uh, Samuel, you did very well on time. Thank you, Dr. Seer. Thank you so much uh, once more for having this discussion. Hopefully this is not the last one. Maybe we can have another one. Uh, I know that a lot of Christian missionaries complain that Muslims are not quite keen to explain or even to um, discuss certain topics pertaining to the Quran. And I find and uh, Lord Dr. Syed for, for doing this today. Um, and hopefully this will fuel other conversations as well. Thank you to everybody that listened. Um, the cordial attitude just in uh, the chat. It is always wonderful to be amongst friends and to have a good discussion surrounding these topics. Thank you so much to Dr. Syed. Uh, that was um, just absolutely wonderful once more to hear from you, to see that you're healthy, and also Samuel uh, for coming to us all the way from Australia. Thank you so much for that. Be blessed, guys, and hopefully we'll have a discussion soon again. And Dr. Well, C, thank you to you as well, your presentation. Thank you for your excellence. Thank you, Samuel. Uh, thank you for your grace for yesterday, as I would call it. I will stop the video on the other laptop as soon as we conclude. Blessings to you guys, and hopefully we'll speak with you guys uh, soon again. Thank you so much. Be blessed. Thank you, so Thank much. you everyone. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you.